I would say, bring to a conclusion our study on the covenants, although we never bring that to a conclusion. But today, uh, when I say conclusion, I mean we'll see the fulfillment of the covenant of Abraham. And uh, once we do that with today's study, we will then go on to see what happens to the Jewish nation, to the Jewish people, and uh, how the church builds from that Jewish nation. In order to accomplish that, we need to verify both from the Bible, biblical sources, and extra-biblical sources, what evidence we may have that Jesus Christ was indeed the fulfillment of the covenant of Abraham. And we will see that today. And in order for us to conclude, or come to that conclusion, we've got to review quickly the covenants. You folks remember the covenants? What was the first covenant? That is not really a true covenant by definition of a covenant, because a covenant has what? It has a proposal and an acceptance and a ceremony, and then it has a meal, right? And then it has a sign, right? In the covenant of Adam, we don't have the proposal and the acceptance, right? We only have the administration of the law, and that law was do not eat from that tree. That was it. And by the way, if we believe that we can gain salvation by keeping the law, just keeping that one law would have been good enough to bring salvation and keep eternal life for Adam and Eve. Just that one law, don't eat from that tree. That's it. But even that got them in trouble and got us all in trouble because the sin was questioning God. After that, we have the covenant of Noah in Genesis chapter 9. There are, within the covenant of Noah, symbols, examples of the covenant of Jesus Christ, the Savior. We did not study that in our previous studies, but the rainbow is what we uh, normally consider as the covenant of Noah. After that, we have the Abrahamic covenant, which... I believe is a foundational covenant for the salvation of man. And that foundational covenant is in this way. In chapter 12, God gives Noah, uh, God gives Abraham how many promises? How many? Three promises. And what were they? He will give them seeds like the sands of the earth and the stars of the sky. He will give them land where they can prosper and be safe, so that the final seed would come through whom? How many nations would be blessed? All nations would be blessed. After that, we have the Mosaic Covenant. Mosaic Covenant was to bolster and strengthen the Abrahamic Covenant. And then once again in the Mosaic Covenant, we have how many? Three parts to it. One was the moral law, the Ten Commandments, which went where? In the Ark of the Covenant. And they were covered by what? The mercy seat. And the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant was where? In the tabernacle. Right? In the tabernacle. And what happened in the tabernacle, which was controlled by the ceremonial law? What was the ceremonial law all about? The ceremonial law was about redemption, was about eternal life, was forgiveness of sin, and was a civil law. Today we want to focus on the ceremonial law a little bit more in that what happened in the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law said, if you sin based on those commandments that are in the Ark of the Covenant, you ought to take a sin offering 
And by the symbolism of the sin offering, you confess your sins, and by the slaying of the offering, and by the blood, it symbolized what? The people didn't really understand the coming of the Messiah, but in God's terms, what did that blood symbolize? The coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And then once a year, in the seventh month, they would have nine days of what they call the Feast of Trumpets. During the time, people reviewed their sins and came to confession. This was a time of judgment. At sunset of the ninth day, Till the sunset of the tenth day was a day of atonement. Right? It was a day of atonement. And that day of atonement was the day when people would get the verdict on whether they were forgiven or whether they were not forgiven. That was basically a ceremonial law. That was the annual program. And after the day of atonement, came the Feast of Tents, the Tabernacles. This was when the people went and they, they stayed in tents, they lived in tents. And they said God would come and tabernacle with them. God would come and live with them. And that was the, that was the symbology of the people going up to heaven to be with God for eternity. That was, so that was the sequence of the last three major uh, feasts of Israel. Now, the next covenant after Moses was what? The covenant of David. What was the covenant of David? We read that earlier today. And let me go back and read that again with you. We start at verse 14. I, no, let me go back a little bit further. Let's go to verse 12, 11, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. I will do what? I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever. I will establish his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. Who is this talking about? This is talking about Jesus Christ. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And this is the seed that was promised to Abraham through whom how many nations would be saved? All nations would be saved. Now, in the temple, how was the temple set up? We had the outer courts. What, happened? what was in the outer courts? We have first the big gate going into the temple. Am I right? We're talking now with the time of Jesus. Which temple was it? Was it a tent still or what was it? What was it? It was at Herod's temple, right? Herod's temple, which was very glamorous. Lots, it's the fanciest building ever built. Herod's temple. He rebuilt Solomon's temple. And so at the outside gates, we have these great big gates that were closed. And they were opened by the priests so that the people could come in and bring their sacrifices. Then inside we have an altar. And what happened at the altar? They slayed the lamb or whatever animal they had. And then there was a fire that would burn the sacrifice. And we're told... That the smell of the sacrifice is what God noted as the sacrifice. That the blood was taken from there. Once a year, what would happen to the blood? The priest would go, and he would go into what area? He'd, to go to the most holy place, he had to have to walk through what area? He'd walk through the holy place. In the holy place, 
there was what? There was the table of showbread. There was incense. There was the lampstand. You remember all that? Yeah. On the lampstand, how many candles? Seven candles. Seven candles. Now, we have uh, some, we have some material that goes into the details of what and how the candelabra or the menorah was made, how the, candles, uh, how the candlesticks were made. We won't go into the details of that because there's some debate on it. But what did the candle, uh, or what did the lampstand indicate? What was it? What was it supposed to uh, represent? The light represents what? Knowledge. Light gives you knowledge. Knowledge from whom? Knowledge from God. Knowledge from God. So there was a door which opened for the people, but it was closed at certain times. There was a candelabra, let's call it, the candlesticks, which indicated that they were the word of God, the wisdom of God. Then on the Day of Atonement, they used to bring some sacrifices. What sacrifices did they bring? First, the priest had to bring a sacrifice. And that sacrifice had to be a bull on behalf of himself and his family. The priest had to confess all of his sins and those of his family. And then he would take the blood on his one finger and he would go into the most holy place and sprinkle it, we're told, seven times. He would touch it on the, on the, on the mercy seat and he sprinkle it seven times. Then he would go back out and sacrifice a goat. Where did the goat come from? They used to bring two goats. They used to bring two goats. And they used to draw lots. And one in the right hand and one in the left hand. And the white, whichever goat got the white, was the goat that was going to be sacrificed. And it was in the right hand. So if the goat in the right hand got the white lot, then that was good. If it was in the left hand, that was bad. If the white one went into the left hand. But they would sacrifice the goat with the white stone, with the white lot. And the other one, the one with the black one, they would take it outside the gates of Jerusalem. And what did the priest do? This is not in the Bible. It's in the Jewish literature, in the, in the Mishnah and the Talmud. The priest's clothing used to be such. God told them how, what to wear. The priest used to, with their robe, they used to wear a scarlet, a crimson color belt. A ribbon, if you will. So what did the priest do? He used to take that crimson colored, that scarlet color belt, that ribbon, he'd cut it in two. And he would tie that one part to the head of the goat. And he would take the other half and tie it to the handle of the door. And what they believed, that when the goat was left out in the wilderness, the goat would eventually die. But when the indication from God was that he accepted their offering, the color of the ribbon would change from scarlet to pure white. Pure white. And we have that in Jewish literature, both in the Talmud and the Mishnah. That was the indication to them that God accepted their confession and their sin offering. Now, so we have what? The lot that had to come up in the right hand. And this didn't always happen. Some half and half, let's say. So half the times it was white, half the times in the, in the wrong hand. 
So, depends. It's game of chances, if you will. In the scarlet thread, we're told that it did turn white. And the priests did their work with opening the doors. And the priests had a job to do with the lampstand. What did they do? They had to make sure morning and night that the lamp never went out. They had to constantly put oil and change the wick. But what they call the western candle, western candle, was never to go out. So they had a way of servicing the western candle that would never go out. That was also part of their duty. Now, on time, as Jesus had promised, and as Jesus was promised in the book of Isaiah, we find he came right on time, as planned by God, to be born where he was supposed to be born, in Bethlehem. At the right time, we studied that earlier. When was Jesus born? We, we had a study on that. And he was born in the town where sacrificial lambs were born. And we know the Last Supper. We read that earlier today. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What was Jesus expecting? He was expecting to be put to death. He was expecting fully to die. He had in Luke 13, in the Olivet Discourse, in the Olivet Sermon, in the Mount of Olives, he had said what? This temple, before too long, there will be not one stone left upon the other. And then he said, if you do, when you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in how many days? In three days. Who was he talking about? He was talking about the temple of Herod, that it would be destroyed soon. But if you destroy this temple, it would be raised up what? Again, in three days. He was talking about his own death. He was aware of his death. Now he is talking to the disciples in 22, in chapter 22. And in verse 14 he says, For I tell you, I will not drink. Where am I? Oh, I jumped a bit. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Until what finds fulfillment? His work. Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. That's verse 17. Until the kingdom of God comes. By the way, for those that wonder about the kingdom of God, did Jesus eat with his disciples when he was on this earth after his resurrection? He did. He did. You know why? Because the kingdom of God started at his resurrection. That is when he defeated Satan. The kingdom of God on this earth was at his resurrection. Verse 19, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. This cup is the what? New Covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. What does that mean? New covenant. What is Jesus doing to the old covenant? What is he doing to the old covenant? Is he canceling it? No. He said, I am come not to destroy the covenant, but to fulfill the covenant. On that Passover, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on that Friday, when all the Paschal lambs were being slain, we're told, 
at that same hour, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible tells us, then he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and died. What is finished? What is finished? The covenant of Abraham is complete. The work of the covenant is done. And what happened around him when that happened, when he died? The sun stopped to shine. The world became dark. And that most holy place, which recognized the Day of Atonement for the people of Israel as a special people whose sins were forgiven. What happened to the curtain? The curtain was torn. The curtain was torn from top to bottom. What did that indicate? What did that indicate? That indicated that the work of the covenant was finished. The work of the old covenant was done. It was complete. And this is recorded in the Bible. The Bible is a record of the early Christians and the disciples. They kept that record of what things that they had seen and what they had heard, but they did not have access any longer to the tabernacle. They were Christians. So, we have the Jews, the rabbis, keeping record of what happened in the tabernacle after that day. After that day. You know, there were other supernatural things happening in the tabernacle. There were other supernatural things happening. And it's recorded. The history of the Jewish faith is recorded in the Talmud. There's two versions of the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud is considered more authentic. But what I'm about to share with you is recorded in both Jerusalem and the Babylonian Talmud. You know that door that was so big, that was so heavy, that it took a couple of people to open it, the door to the tabernacle. We're told that when they closed the door, the doors used to open by themselves. The Talmud records that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And it says after AD 30, approximately AD 30, when was Jesus crucified? About AD 30. It said approximately for 40 years, get this, for 40 years, the doors were just open. Nobody opened them. Why? Because the covenant of Abraham was fulfilled. Jesus, to whom the tabernacle pointed, had come. The real sacrifice had been made. What about the candlesticks? The priests tried hard to keep the candlesticks lit. And that same Talmud records on page 156 and 157 of the Jerusalem Talmud. And on page 39b of the Babylonian Talmud, it records all these four things I'm going to tell you. The western candle that was supposed to be lit constantly, that was never supposed to be off, would just blow itself up. And the priests could not keep it lit. Do you know why? Because Jesus said what? 
I am the light. Jesus is the light. He is the wisdom of God. He is the knowledge of God. He is the law. Jeremiah said, I will take the law and write it where? In your hearts. The previous law, the old covenant law, was on tables of stone. And it was outside. But we are told that Jesus is going to live where? Inside this temple. Inside this body. And he becomes the law inside you and I. Therefore, that is a fulfillment of the prophecy of who Jesus was. And that law is now in us, not outside. So Jesus was the sacrifice, and he was the law. He was the wisdom. And this is what records and gives us the knowledge of who he was. He is the word. The goats. The same Talmud records that as of the year that the temple was destroyed in the year 70, the Talmud records that for 40 years consecutively when they cast lots for the goats, not one time did the white lot come in the right hand of the priest. Not once. In 40 years. You know why? Because there was no longer a need for that earthly sacrifice. Why? Because that sacrifice was Jesus Christ. He had done the work. He had finished the work. He was a symbol. There was, there was a symbolism. The goats were a symbolism. But he was the real thing. And this is not Christians recording this. These are Jews recording it. That goat used to have that scarlet thread or the scarlet belt, half of it around its horns, and the other half on the handles of the doors. Once again, the Talmud records that in the last 40 years, the scarlet belt, the scarlet thread, didn't turn white even once. It stopped. It stopped. What does that mean? That means that the work of the tabernacle was done. It was finished. Jesus Christ has fulfilled the promise of the sacrifice for our sins. He is the Lamb. He is the everlasting King. His throne will last forever. His kingdom did start when the Bible told us it would start. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to go to chapter 8. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Get it? If Jesus is our high priest and our sacrifice in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, where is there a need for a tabernacle here on earth? That tabernacle stopped working, not in A.D. 70, in A.D. 40 years before that, A.D. 30. And we didn't have to wait a hundred years, a thousand years, or 1844 for Jesus to go into the most holy place. The Bible tells us in chapter 8, he went and sat down at the right hand of God. 
Verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned that when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you in the mountain. But in the fact, the ministry Jesus received is as superior to those as the covenant of which he is a mediator, is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. It doesn't say that the new covenant will be established. The new covenant is established. The new covenant is already established. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found faith with the people and said, The days are coming, declare the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the, co like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. And after that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they need to teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. No longer do they have to teach their neighbor. Why? Because the neighbor will know God. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, what is it? How does it finish? Matthew 28 finishes by saying this. All power in heaven and earth is given, what? Is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. How many nations? All nations. What did God say to Abraham? Through you, how many nations will be blessed? All nations will be blessed through you. What does Jesus say is the ultimate sign of his coming back? When the gospel of, when the message of this gospel is given to all the world, then will the end come. God didn't make the plan of salvation for the Jews. He made it for all nations. And he kept the remnant that they may reach all nations. That through the Jews, all nations would be blessed. It is not, I believe, a true or biblical teaching to say that God despised or was angry with the Jews, that he destroyed the temple because he, he was hateful to them. I don't believe. Dispensational teaching goes into that, that God punished them, that is eventually going to go back and rebuild the temple, and Jews will be more favored than everybody else and all that kind of stuff. We don't need to go there. Nor do we have any reason to hate the Jews. You know why? Because it was through the Jews that God made salvation available to each one of us. When their spiritual work was done, God still kept their physical promises. God always keeps his promises. God's promises to the Jews are both spiritual and temporal. When the spiritual promises were complete, he still maintains their temporal promise and gives them success. We are not to bemoan that. We are not to think terrible of that. That's God's will. But we are more grateful for the salvation that comes to us through the Jews and to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. It is for this reason we're going, when we start studying the book of Revelation, you notice that Jesus tells John, Write to who? Write this to the? What? 
seven churches where? Where? In Israel? In Galilee? Where? In Asia. The seven churches in Asia. What about the most important church in Jerusalem? How come? Not to Jerusalem, but the seven churches in Asia. You know why? They were all the churches that came out of the Gentiles. That they are now part of the plan of God. The church in Jerusalem had done its work. And it was through the church in Jerusalem and through the persecution that the word began to spread. And all nations were blessed. Therefore, we will see that the book of Revelation is a book of good news about the fulfillment of the gospel. It's not a scary book. No. It's a book about the fulfillment of the covenant of God that through you, all nations will be blessed. Jesus Christ himself he said in John chapter 20, go and tell others after he had breathed on the apostles the Holy Spirit. And through that spirit, Jesus lives in our hearts. The law lives in our hearts. Romans chapter 12 tells us what? That we are the temple of God. We are the holy temple of God because God now has written the law in our hearts and in our minds that through his power we may be transformed day by day to be like him. But let us remember that the fulfillment of the death of Jesus Christ once and for all fulfilled the covenant and all those symbols in the tabernacle were fulfilled right then and right there when Jesus went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And by the way, there's symbolism behind the right hand and the left hand. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish body that judged people for doing right or wrong. And if a person was found to be innocent, they would sit at the right hand in order that they would be declared righteous and without fault. If a person was found guilty, they would sit at the left hand so the sentence would be pronounced on them. It is for that reason that the Bible tells us Jesus sat at the right hand of God because his sacrifice was accepted by God on behalf of all of us who confess Jesus as our Savior and our Master. He sat there on our behalf. May God grant that as we continue to study the Bible, and I urge you to go home and double check everything you hear from me. In this day and age, you can check everything right away. Go home and double check to make sure that what we're learning is in fact biblical and true or historical. May God bless you and continue to pray for me as I pray for you.